World Denver is a nonprofit organization that connects Denver to the world. We do it through exchange programs that bring hundreds of students and professionals to Denver from all over the world, through community engagement events featuring experts, authors, world leaders discussing the most important global issues, and through middle and high school education programs that encourage students to be more engaged global citizens. And the vision of World Denver is that Denver is a much more globally connected city where all people and all communities have an opportunity to learn about and engage with the world. Everyone has a place at World Denver if they care about global connection. I think for years I've been involved with World Denver and I've heard about the homestay program. And I was interested, one, um, to have my daughter have an experience of <laughs> having an international visitor um, and also to learn about other cultures. I found it really interesting to learn about different cultures and see why they're different but also the same and what connects us even across like the entire world. It creates a deeper understanding of each other and different cultures and opens up lines of communication and perspective and understanding that can only be useful for all manner of things, right? Well, we know that the world has some huge global challenges and we know that the answer to solving global challenges is global cooperation. We love showing that off at World Denver. We love showing off all the leaders. We love showing off that cooperative spirit that exists in Denver between businesses and nonprofits and government agencies. We know that as leaders, we have a lot to teach the world and we have a lot to learn from the world. We also know that in the meetings that we host through our international exchange programs, connections are made that lead to long-term, lifelong strategic partnerships and even more economic development for our city. We know that a global city is a thriving city, so every single day we work to make that possible. My favorite part was the interacting in the job shadowing placements and places. Um, and that was a great experience, met different people, and also like, I was really exposed to different careers and different parts that you can take in life that are mainly focused on STEM that I wasn't really exposed to. So I think that's the greatest and the, my best, the best part of this whole experience. One of my best experiences when I was in Colorado would probably be um, going up the Denver mountains to go see snow. And it was actually my first time seeing snow. So it was super exciting. In 2021, World Denver became the new permanent home of the World Affairs Challenge, a middle school and high school program with a 30 year history of engaging students in conversations around sustainability and encouraging them to become more engaged global citizens. There's so many ways to get involved with World Denver and to support international connection in Denver. First and foremost, you can become a member. Membership fuels everything we do. You can also volunteer, host international visitors in your home, whether it's through homestays or world dinners, or you can become a judge in the World Affairs Challenge. Everyone is welcome at World Denver. If you care about global engagement, if you know the power of international exchange, if you want to see Denver as a more thriving, globally connected city, we have a place for you and we hope you'll join us. Well, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm Fritz Mayer, the Dean of the Corbell School. So welcome to my house. It's great to have you here um, uh, and, and to welcome you to this uh, really terrific event um, this evening, which we're proud to host with our friends at World Denver, this film you just saw. Um, uh, I want, also want to extor extend a very warm welcome to our special guest this evening, Nobel Peace Prize win winner, the May Bowie. Um, we are so honored that she is joining us this evening. Um, this event is an important one for, for, for many reasons. Um, for us here at the Corbell School, it marks the 60th uh, anniversary of our founding, um, then the Graduate School of International Affairs. And we're proud to build an international affairs school uh, that is focused on training our students to meet the urgent issues of our time, including, including threats to democracy, to climate change, uh, to economic inequality or equality. Uh, and certainly the issues of social justice and human rights. Um, and as part of that commitment, um, we are thrilled to have built a very strong faculty and curriculum uh, on issues related to women's leadership, um, especially in contexts of 
conflict and peace building in particular. And we're proud to be the home of the Inclusive Global Leadership Initiative, IGLI for short, uh, which is an effort to elevate and amplify the world of women activists, uh, women identified activists who are promoting peace, human rights and justice across the world. Um, it's really quite a remarkable program. Many of the activists who've come through IGLI have been profoundly inspired by Ms. Bowie's story of organizing women in Liberia to stop the war. So it is a special day when we can host an event like this to invite all of you in the room, students and community members alike, uh, to hear firsthand about the powerful and important work women like Ms. Bowie have done across the world to challenge war and build peace in their communities. We were just talking uh, off stage about the power of meeting someone like her in person uh, and, and, the, and the ways in which that makes the things that you read in the paper or see in the news come alive, uh, particularly, I think, for students um, and maybe particularly for our women students. Our, our moderator tonight uh, is uh, probably familiar to um, most of you, um, uh, the founder of the IGLI program and also the director of the C Center for International Security and Diplomacy and an expert on the impact of war on women, having done so much work on this topic all over the globe. That's Dr. Professor Marie Berry, our own. So, um, <laughs> indeed. Uh, and I am um, uh, just thrilled that uh, Marie will be facilitating our event tonight uh, with our guest of honor. Uh, in many ways, Ms. Bowie needs no introduction. She is a Liberian peace activist, social worker, and women's rights advocate. Now, LeMay is best known for leading a nonviolent movement that brought together Christian and Muslim women to play a pivotal role, pivotal role in ending Liberia's truly devastating 14-year civil war in 2003. This historic achievement paved the way for the election of Africa's first female head of state, Liberian President Ellen Johnson Sirleaf. It also marked the vanguard of a new wave of women emerging worldwide as essential and uniquely effective participants in brokering lasting peace and security. She's the author of the book, Mighty Be Our Powers, and the star of the film, Pray the Devil Back to Hell. Today, she is founder and president of the Bowie, Bowie Peace Foundation Africa based in Monrovia which provides educational and leadership development opportunities for women, girls, and youth. She serves on the board of directors of the Nobel Women's Initiative and the Peace Jam Foundation. So please join me in welcoming Professor Marie Berry and Nobel Peace Prize winner, LeMay Bowie, to the stage. Well, it's a, an absolute honor to be able to play host this evening with our guest, Nobel Peace Prize winner, Lema Bowie. And it's actually been one of those, you've been one of those people on my lists that I just would love to interview for so many years that this is also a real treat for me. And it's a joy to see all of you here. Um, thank you so much for coming, for taking the time, and for joining us um, in this space tonight. As Dean Mayer mentioned, um, many of you may have learned a little bit about Lema's story from the film Pray the Devil Back to Hell, or her fantastic book, which has been on my syllabi for many years, um, Mighty Be Our Powers. But some of you might not be as familiar with her story. And so I want to just begin tonight um, by asking you, Lema, to share with us a little bit about your early life, your childhood, and what it was like growing up in Liberia. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. It's truly an honor um, to be here this evening 
and to see a full house on a Thursday night. Thank you all for coming. Um, so I am the fourth of five girls. My mother never had a son, so you can imagine that for many years, she was the ridicule of many people because having a son is very important in many families. Um, our grandmother, who died in 2021 at the age of 115, <laughs> so I'm here for a long time, <laughs> was our primary caregiver. And I tell people that she was our first feminist teacher. Um, Ma, as we called her, was the one who taught all of us the alphabet. She had a fifth grade education, and that's where she stopped, and then she was married off. Um, but that fifth grade education was what she used to start all of her grandchildren off in kindergarten. I tell people that my story, and just this afternoon I was telling Ebenezer Noma when he was driving me here that I'm not the stereotypical African story. That story of, oh, they never allow us to go to school. And it, no, I grew up empowered. I grew up hearing that you can do anything you want to do. I grew up hearing that education is important for your future. You know, and all of those things, I, I, I think literally my siblings and I, we had such self-confidence that we were just troublemakers. <laughs> like, we, we, we were sent to jail many times for fighting in the neighborhood, and it would probably be boys that were fighting. So I'm just laying this premise to say that, even as girls, and we had, my grandmother was a member of every secret society in Liberia. So she was very powerful. So she was part of the male society, a part of the female society. So if you're from West Africa or from Africa, you know when they have those societies, it's primarily for men, for women, but she could go into any society. Mm -hmm. She was really very powerful. When it was time for us to go and do FGM, they came, I remembered, we're very young, and there was a lot of whispers in the living room, and my dad came outside and said, my daughters are not going. And he stood up to it. We did not. If anyone tried to take my daughters to do the female genital mutilation, I'll kill them. So on one end, we have these women who were telling us you can do anything. And on the other end, we have this man who was telling us I will protect you from tradition and culture. So that was the life that we grew up with. We grew up, my, our grandmother used to say, when you get married, if your husband brings rice, you should be able to bring the charcoal to cook the rice. And the way I, I now understand it, because I've been able to take that statement, unpack it, do my own analysis, and literally what she was saying to us was, you must dominate your space. Don't ever allow anyone to dominate your space for you. You have to own the space that God has given you on this earth. You must be the author of your story. You must be the champion of your game. You must be the soldier in your battle. So that was the mindset I went into life with. And so high school, I went into politics in high school. I was senator for my school. 2019, we celebrated our 30th high school reunion, and I will end with that. And there was this one girl who said to me, you know, I hated you so badly in high school. And I said, why? She said, because you came in that high school at 10th grade, and I had been there all my life. But the first week of you being in that school, the entire school knew you. And then I said, I'm so sorry that you hated me, but unfortunately, I never saw you. <laughs> so if I do the math right, the 2019 30th high school reunion marked exactly 30 years since 1989. And in 1989, in Liberia, which is, 
I think most are familiar with, a very small country, about five million people in West Africa. In 1989, uh, person named Charles Taylor invaded the country and, over, and basically started a, a war. Um, and that war lasted until 1997, when Charles Taylor was eventually then elected president shortly thereafter. And we'll get into the details of this, but I want to know what changed that moment. It was right around the time you graduated from high school that the war began. Exactly one day. My graduation was, 20, was December 23rd, 1989, and December 24th, 1989, the war started. And, and, and I, I tell people that we took it for a joke from December to March to April to May to June. I started college, science college. My dream was to become a pediatrician. See how far I am from that. <laughs> My dream was to become a pediatrician, and then one morning, all hell broke loose. And the way I like to describe it is that I woke up a 17-year-old girl, and by 6 p.m., I was an adult at the twinkle of an eye because my mother had gone to work, my father had gone to work, my older siblings had all left to go to work or to university. I had a lit class. And then that morning, like, really loud shooting, and my younger siblings were home, I'm the older of my siblings at home, nieces and nephews. By 5 p.m., over 25 internally displaced people from our church had come. And then my aunt is looking at me and saying to me, I can't take any decisions. This is your father's house. You are the only one of his children here. You have to decide. In that moment, I'm deciding who sleeps where, she's whispering to me, there are documents, there are jewelries, there should be this, you need to. So yeah, am I carefree, basketball loving, nightclub going, teenager, and all of a sudden I have to think about documents and solidifying the future of our home, thinking about how 25 people will eat, and that was the beginning of me taking care of people, and I haven't stopped till today a huge rupture, right, between the way that life was before and the way that life then proceeded. And it sounds, having read so much about you over the years, that it fundamentally changed the course of your, of your career, your studies, and your life. Totally, totally. I mean, one of the defining moments for me was a young man, we were all internally displaced together at the church, and he left and said he was going to the Taylor side. So the country had been divided into different factions, and we were still on the government side. My mom kept saying to him, don't go. And he kept saying, I can't stay here. So he went, and by 4 p.m. that day, strangely, we're listening to Focus on Africa, BBC, and the the, the, the presenter was saying that they had just killed a group of young men and that he found this ID and he literally called this young man's name. And then my classmate that was very close to him and all of his siblings had been killed. So we're just hearing news of people who had future. One minute this person, and I told myself, what is the use of going to college, then to med school? I mean, when one tiny object can undo everything that you sacrifice for. So I'm not going back to school. I'm, I, I got angry at God. No one should call God's name where I'm seated. I'm not going to pray. I'm not going to do anything. I'm not, like, literally. I was just in beast mode, angry, looking for food, wake up in the morning. My mom lost her mind. So one day she's sitting, she said, people, because my dad was in the government, we still had food. And she had such confidence in the government that my sister had come home one day and said she was working in medical records at the government hospital, and people had come to look for the medical records of 100 children. And she said no one brought 100 children here. So they, they checked emergency, everything, no children. Eventually, we heard that the government soldiers had taken those 100 children and thrown all of them in a well. My mom refused to believe that, so that was a point of contention between her and my sister. 
So this day, all along, she's still saying the government soldiers are the good guys. This day, I'm going to look for greens and other things. We still have rice, but we have money, so I have to go and look for other food. I come back, and my mom is just sitting there like she's lost her mind. And she's crying and saying, I killed a man. I killed a man. I killed her. So I'm wondering, how did you, did you kill someone? And then this, she said, this guy was digging in the garbage. And she got up, and they, there was a wire fence. So she went and stood at the fence and said to him, what are you looking for? He said, I'm looking for palm kernels. She said, to do what? He said, to take home for my children and I will crack it and eat it. She said, you don't have food? He said, no. So she went inside and brought five cups, five or ten cups of rice and handed it to him. In that moment, the soldiers came. She went back and sat down. And they asked him, who gave you the rice? He's afraid to say her because she will be in trouble. He's just standing there. And in those days, they used to call rice gold dust. It's either you were a rebel if you had rice or you worked with government. In any case, anyone who had rice was in danger of being killed. And this man stood there looking, looking, looking. He couldn't say, she gave it to me. They took the rice from him and point blank executed him right there. So when I came, she had no ability to make decisions on, let's eat this, let's go here. So not only did I lose my childhood and everything, I then became a caregiver for someone who was mentally unstable. Yeah. That is such a tremendous weight to carry, the caregiving, also to see your mother in that in that in that condition and and to have so much of you know your family to also be thinking about and I know that there was so much displacement um, during the war and I'm wondering if you can tell us or share us a little bit about what you witnessed and experienced in terms of how the war didn't only you know come to people's homes but but caused massive numbers of people to flee everything that they that they knew every bit of safety that they had we were before before the war, three million people, one million were internally displaced, just to give you an idea. 500,000 became refugee, and these are all estimated figures. We had to move more than 10 times. Like, you come to this place, you sleep this night, and then there's a missile attack, then you have to move to another place, and you move again, and you move again. So we're persistently moving. One neighborhood we went to, the bedroom, was the size of this stage. We were 50 people, five zero. So at night, if you manage to find a spot, you sleep for like three hours, and then someone will come and tap you. You have to go and sit outside for someone else to come and sleep. That's how we slept for probably a week, because at that time we were separated from our father. So we didn't know where he was. He didn't know where we were. People went and told him they had killed all of us. We heard that he had been killed. So those were the kinds of things that we're dealing with. Families just moving endlessly, aimlessly. People sleeping outside. Anyone can offer you a place to sleep. When, when I think back, and a lot of the memories from the war I've suppressed for good reasons. But when I think back, this is something that I don't wish on my worst enemy. Recently, last year, we went to Poland and then to Ukraine. And so whilst we were in Poland, they said, let's go to the refugee center. We got there. And just seeing the sheets like that, dividing the room, I lost it. I cried the entire time on live TV. There was nothing they could get out of me. All of the prepared statement went out the window because just that divided sheet brought back memories that I thought had gone away. And so that's, that's how you live when you've been through what we've been through in Liberia. Yeah, It's gutting thinking about the scale of displacement today. I mean, 
in, in I think the number now is that there's 110 million forcibly displaced people in the world today, um, in, inside and outside of their countries of origin. And that's just, just that scale. And you think about all the rooms, like the room you were in, and, and it just, it, it, you know, it but catches Marie, your breath. The one thing you need to also understand is that the war lasted so long that at one point I was carrying my nieces and nephew as refugees. Then at another point, I was carrying my own children. That's, that's, that's the progression. So one, at one stage, is family members, I'm like nieces, nephew. At another stage, is me with two very young children, pregnant on a ship that is about to sink, trying to find our way out of Liberia to Ghana. So many different parts of the story that you, 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 you don't want to wish on your worst enemy, went to the largest refugee camp in Jordan a few years ago. It was a long convoy, very important people, presidents and all of that. And we were the small people on the delegation. And at some point they said, the convoy needs to leave. And who's holding the convoy up? Lema. Because I'm seated on the sidewalk and I see me in a young girl with hopes and dreams of becoming a translator at the UN. And she's talking so passionately. She has perfected her English. So everyone is calling her to talk. I'm glued, I'm stuck there. And they, they come, 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 we need to leave, we need to leave. But I'm not seeing this girl anymore. I'm seeing myself. That's, it's such a powerful, I mean, I can't even imagine. Um, I'm, I, the, we get to the late 1990s, and the first Liberian War comes to an end, mm. and there's an election of Charles Taylor to the presidency of the country. Two years later, there is an invasion. There's kind of another sort of emergence, outbreak of conflict as a group of rebels decides to uh, challenge Taylor's regime what what was this what was it like for you when there was this breather in some ways a couple of years where things were more peaceful at some level or they weren't it, it tell us then it yeah. was never peaceful it's i mean people assume that when the guns are silent then there's peace and my definition of peace is not the absence of war but the presence of conditions that dignify all if in those days there were checkpoints, you could get beaten terribly or even killed if your car light was too bright at a checkpoint. The soldiers were ruthless. They could come in your community and take anything. Those were the conditions. People, the way people say, so some guy put it this way, say 65% of the population overwhelmingly voted for Charles Taylor and asked him to lead us, and he decided to be a ruler. And so things were well, and then he was still meddling in Sierra Leone. He was still doing everything evil in any other place that he could, he could do, do whatever he needed to do. And so these people came, war, the war started again, and before we knew it, we were running. But I was very, very angry. And when we decided that we needed to do something to end the war, it was that moment in the lives of all of the women who your child is seven years old and that child is going to school. Imagine a seven-year-old child and then someone takes him or her, puts them in a pickup truck that night, gives them an AK-47, teaches them how to shoot and the next morning, send them to the war front. So people, children going to school were being taken. People, daughters were being taken. Mothers were saying, what do we do? And so I said we were pushed so far back to the wall that we either go through the wall or we fight back. And our way, the protesting was to fight back. In those days, you read CNN, you read, I mean, you, you watch CNN, you read New York Times, all you will hear about is the blood diamonds 
Charles Taylor, and no one was talking about the women, which is still the same today, who were suffering as a result of the war. And so when we stepped out, we decided we wanted the narrative to change. So we, we had no clue. Please, none of us went to any institution to learn active nonviolence, to learn anything. We were just going by our head. We started with 10 US dollars from someone's handbag, and then the rest of it is history. If someone said, let's go pick it there, we went there. If someone said, go block this place, we went there. There was this one time the UN sent a delegation to Liberia, and they were the International Crisis Contact Group on Liberia for Peace. And we get to where they were with our statement. So we had this statement, we had laminated it, and we kept it in our clothes, like you tie your lapa, and you put it in there. And so we get there, and the soldiers were driving us. And this Swedish guy comes and stands at the gate of the UN compound. Next thing he goes in, several white folks come, goes in several, and then one of the young women, very brave, said to me, boss, I'm crossing the street. I said, well, those boys have AK-47. She said, these white people are there, and they won't allow him to shoot me. So she crossed the street, and they were trying to push her back, and this guy from Sweden said, no, let her through. And she handed them the statement. and said, do you have more like that? We handed the statement. But those were the things the U.S. Embassy would decide. So they know what would work. We'll just go and lie there and block the place. So our protest action was, there's a need for us to change the trend of how the world is discussing this war. Everyone was too focused on the warlords and not the women and the children that were being killed, that were being adopted, and we decided it's time for us to shift that. So when we got out, it was our pain, our shame, everything that we had gone through that we put out there and protested. So when I read a bit about the first days of this movement, there really were just a handful of women. We started with seven, yeah. $10, a press statement that, that we put out in the newspaper. But I think the reason why it gained traction was because we signed our names. Mm. Unlike the modern day activists behind their computers who say, we the people, no. It was not we the people. All of us signed. And so the next day, the media wanted to know who were these crazy women. Immediate unconditional ceasefire. Charles Taylor had said he will fight until the last soldier die. Peaceful dialogue. He said he was a legitimate government. He could not negotiate with the rebels. The deployment of an intervention force, Liberia was a sovereign nation and could not allow foreign troops on the soil. So everything he said he would not do was everything we had in that document. And at that moment when we signed, people were asking, is this your death wish? Because this is one of the most notorious governments in the world. How do you sign your names to this from seven to 60? to 65, to 200, 250, 1,000, the day we came out to protest over 10,000 women. Wow. <laughs> Tell me what happened next. Well, we, we had some crazy moments. Just recently, we celebrated 18 years of the signing of the peace agreement in Liberia, August 18. <laughs> I mean, we celebrated 20 years. 18, August 18 was 20 years of the signing. And we sat down to reminisce, group of the sisters and I. After we protested the first day, Taylor did not stop because we protested outside, close, on an open field. Second day, we didn't see him. Third day, we decided it's time to take the message to him. We did seven letters. His wife, his brother, his office, himself, Parliament, just about anyone we knew knew him. We sent this letter to him so he couldn't say. And then after several weeks, he decided he would meet us. But the instruction that he gave his soldiers was that if we were less than 25, they should not allow us in. Because there, there, there was such a politics of fear. And that's where the world is today, from the U.S. to everywhere. If you want people not to take action, just instill fear in them. 
So that politics of fear of him saying, if anyone got on the streets to protest, even if his mother was amongst, they should beat the hell out of them. So that was the politics that he was playing. So they didn't expect that 25 women would be brave to show up. So when I got to the executive mansion that day, I asked the guy, I said, you said 25 if we're less than 25. And I said, what if we're more than 25? And he looked at me and smirked, mm, let me see. So I said, OK. I whipped out my phone and told the women, form your line and come down. 2,500 women show up that day. <laughs> and as we were com the women were coming down, it was like sea of white. He was like, oh my God, these women are serious. Then we get a message from him that, oh no, he can't see 25 women. I mean, he can't see all of us. 10 of us should come into his office. I said, no. So back and forth, back and forth, and they said, oh, the president wants to see. I told the women, sit down. I'm going up and tell him, give him a piece of my mind. Because I was just in beast mode. And so as I was going, they said, no, 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 no. He changed his mind. And the security kept saying to me, why do you want to go to jail? Why do you want to be killed? And so he said, no, he said he's coming. So he came downstairs, and he's sitting like this, and they put the podium. But the way they set the podium, my back would have been to him. And that statement is supposed to be read to him. So I said, turn the podium. The guy was like, just read the thing. I said, no. So by myself. I turned the podium around so that he could see me reading whatever I had to read. And then they offer us seats. So he's sitting there with all of his people, and they offer us seats. And when they offer us the seat, we got there, pushed the seat, and sat on the floor. That was our way. So once we left, after that meeting with him, he agreed to go to the peace talks. And then it was another journey. We went for, we thought it was going to be for seven days. We had $5,000. We went and mobilized other women from Ghana. Seven of us went. The number seven is very significant to all of the things that we did. We went to Ghana, mobilized women. The one week, 10 days of peace talks turned to three months. We ran out of money. We're sleeping. We didn't have hotels anymore. We're sleeping on the floor. I had a tiny house there. We're sleeping on the floor in the house, but every morning we're committed to going. The talks were going nowhere. And so one day, I was losing interest because I was getting angry. And when you're doing nonviolence work, anger is the last thing you want to have in you. Because it, 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 you can't think, you can't focus. That morning, I went to read the news. Every morning, that was my routine. And this young girl had just given birth. And she went out to hang her baby diapers. And two little boys, who were the ages of my two sons at the time, were brushing their teeth. And a missile landed and killed all three of them. I watched that video over and over. And I'm crying. Then I called my mentor, Sugar Scooper, and said, Sugars, get more women. We're coming to do something today. We get to the Peace Hall. I sit down, we send for more women. I told the women, lock arms, lock arms in front of the door. So the delegates are in like this room. And so we sit to all of the entry point and we lock arms. And then I write a hostage note and send it in to say that the piece of tap on this and this Nigerian general came and took the note, took it in. And all we could hear on the overhead speaker was distinguished ladies and gentlemen, the peace hall has been seized by General Lema and her people. <laughs> so they said they're coming to arrest me because I was obstructing justice. So I decided I was stripped naked. <laughs> and by the time I started, the police left me and they started telling us, oh, some of the men are jumping out the window. So we fortified the place. We, the, the mediator then came and negotiated with us. But I tell anyone that Liberia has seen 20 years of peace is because first God led us to do that action. Because afterwards, less than two weeks later, August 18, they signed the Comprehensive Peace Agreement. Did we end there? No. We went to Liberia, took the peace agreement apart. And the reason why I'm taking my time to t tell this is because most times 
when you're doing peace work, people tend to think that, oh, after they sign the peace agreement, peace arrived. No. We were determined because that was like the 16th or 15th peace agreement that we've signed. So we were determined to ensure that we implemented it to the letter. We took it apart, went to Liberia, sat down, 80 women leaders. We set benchmarks from this time to this time, this time to this time. And we were determined to ensure that everything was implemented. At the end of the day in October, we got Africa's first female president because of the hard work. And the way Christiana Amampo sometimes would say to me, Lema, without you and the work the women did, President Sirleaf would not have been president of the Republic of Liberia. And I believe it. I tell people her elections was the icing on the cake that we already baked with the peace work that we did. So that's, where, that's how we've come now to 20 years of uninterrupted shooting. I don't want to call it peace. You know, if we can go back, I, I, I would be remiss if I didn't ask about something that I think you get asked about a lot, which you mentioned. And I think when you mentioned, I, I stripped naked, right? There's this, there, there, this is quite a famous story now about you, and, and there's, there's some video of it too, of you really holding your ground and in a powerful way shaming these men in that room for daring to be so stubborn as to not continue negotiating and hammering out the hard work of peace. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit more about the types of strategies that you've seen yourself and others in the movement use in these, in these ways that were really, I think, you know, both specific to the context that you were in. I think it's important to note that this, this, this is a way of shaming kind of men, the seeing the naked body of a, of a mother, kind of shaming men in this context. Um, that's one of many tools that you used in this movement. And I'm curious if you can just share anything that might inspire you know, others that are looking around the globe at their own work and their own activism. Well, um, when we, um, they, someone asked this question, what, why do you think a group of men who allegedly ordered the rape of maybe a, an approximate or alleged 65% of the population, why do you think they would care when a, handful, a few handful of women um, stripped naked? Someone, one of the warlords said, the moment he stood at that door and saw us trying to disrobe, the only question he's, he asked himself what have we done to bring our mothers to the place where they would give up their dignity? And for me, that action in that moment, culturally, it was bad luck for them to see our naked bodies. But for me, everything that I talk about the beginning of my grandmother socializing me, the socialization was that we, the strong will protect the weak and all of the different things. I saw it crumble in that moment. And so my disrobing was to tell them that the last shred of my dignity, I'm giving it to you all in protest. The other part, some, the other strategy we used was that Liberia was so polarized along ethnic, religious, so our movement was made of Christian and Muslim women. And one of the slogans we used was, can the bullet tell a Christian from a Muslim? Our movement also made use of women at the community levels, but we never went into those communities to tell them how to carry out their activities because we were very much aware that in as much as we're all Liberians, we're all living through war, every context had different story. Every community was, was a different war context. So we, we dealt with every group at a different level. You know? So all of these different things. So then when I look at different movements, uh, 2008, I was in Israel. We screened the documentary, Pray the Devil Back to Hell. When we came out of the room, some of the Israeli women came to me to say, I'm sorry, this is not our reality, 2008. We went to Palestine, to Palestine, we went to the West Bank, and we screened the documentary there. 
some of the young women from Palestine were so upset and say, why are, not, why are the older women not doing what you all did? We should take up and do this kind of thing. 2013, Israel had those 14 days of war. And a woman said to me, her two sons had been taken to join the army. So their wives were at home with them with their very young children. And her husband is a retired army personnel. They're sitting in the basement of the house, these two young women and these children. She said, and it dawned on her that if these boys die on the front, this is us right here. She got up, went upstairs, put on a white T-shirt, wore a jeans trousers, took a poster, and wrote, we want peace. And as she was leaving the house, she saw someone, a guy. He said, where are you going? She said, I'm going to stand in the street corner to protest, even if it is just me. He said, no, it's not just you. There are a group of women, women standing there at Netanyahu's house. They are apparently protesting. That was the birth of the women wage peace. Eventually, women wage peace got in touch with Palestinian women. And 2014, they asked me, can you come? Pray the devil back to hell had become an inspiration for them. I went in 2016, and they had that march from community to community. Tens of thousands of Israeli and Palestinian women bending together to say, we want peace in this nation. So the point that I'm making is that at some point, we, when people start to talk, yes, you can only use Liberia's experience as an inspiration. You can't copy and paste. And that's the problem I have with the UN when it comes to peace. Peace building, peace processes. Because they think every peace process is copy and paste. It, there must be contextual analysis. People must know that this, this, and this. So we use many different strategies, including sex strike in our rural areas. The strike, sex strike was effective because the women told the men that they needed to fast and pray for peace. So if as they were fasting, they couldn't have sex. So they spent all their nights and days in the churches and in the mosques, and their husbands agreed. In Monrovia, they had a different strategy, and we started seeing spike in domestic violence. So we told the women, you can end your strike. But the rural community, in one community, on the day that they ended their protests, I saw all these old men who would be going on the farm coming with roses. And I was asking one of the women, I said, why are they giving you all flowers? He said, oh, tonight we'll end the sex strike, so they have to be nice to us. <laughs> Lema, you know, I've been I've been very privileged in so many ways to do work in many places around the world that have been impacted by war, including in Israel and Palestine, in Rwanda, in Bosnia, in Colombia, in Sri Lanka, in Nepal, in a lot of places. And I cannot tell you how many times women I'm interviewing say, have you seen Pray the Devil Back to Hell? I've, I've heard this in rural parts of Colombia. I've heard this in Ramallah. I've heard this in Rwanda. I've heard this in rural Bosnia. And it's something about the model of standing strong and fiercely demanding peace in unison with other women that I think really has launched generations of activists around the world. It's, it's I'm, you know, I'm grateful <laughs> for that film, I think, because it really catalyzed the story. And of course, then, a few years later, the Nobel Peace Prize in 2011. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about your work since those things and what you've witnessed and what you've seen around the world? And maybe to start, what sorts of movements or work that women have been doing have it, have you seen and thought that's really important, that's really impressive? Oh, I think everywhere I've been, I'm, I'm always blown away by the strength, the tenacity of women. Um, I'll take you back to Congo DRC. Um, I went there, and those were the days the headlines were saying Congo was the rape capital of the world. 
and sitting with the women, they said, they started asking, what's the biggest problem you all have here? And the answer was women's leadership. And I said, what about rape? It's, rape is a, as a result of leaders failing to implement all of the policies and laws that we have here. But if we had a lot of women in those seats, so then prioritize the problems. Women's leadership came first. Women's economic empowerment came second. Because one of the things they said is, if we had our own money, even for ourselves, our daughters would not be forced into early marriages. And if you are abused, you can leave and go somewhere. So all of those different things. But one of the things that I saw in Congo that just blew me away, they had this circle of women who had been sexually abused. They were survivors of sexual violence. And they were about 100 in a group. Every time they heard that some new person had been violated and was taken to Ponzi, these women would go there. And those who had clothes will offer clothes. Those who have food will offer food. And once that person was discharged, someone was given the tax of staying with that person to bring them back to life. So when we were having this meeting, there was this very cute baby, and I held him played with him because if you want to get me, bring a baby around. Even after nine children, I'm still looking for more. And so <laughs> playing with him, and then the mother started to tell her story that she was in a mine, and she was raped repeatedly. When they phoned her, she was almost dead. And then she was pregnant. But there was no way they could terminate the pregnancy. She would have lost her life. So when she came through, these women brought her this one woman she was assigned to, she now calls her mother, nursed her back to life. Here's the baby. And so at that moment, she was strong enough now to start a business. So they needed for someone to give her a seed grant for her to do her business. So I, I was the person who did the seed grant. But she said the biggest sadness that she carries is tomorrow, if her son asks her, who is my father, what answer would she give to her child? You know, so, but those women, just that circle of support that they have around each other. Then I go to Libya, where after Gaddafi leaves, no one could talk about rape publicly. So I'm in meetings, these women are talking, hush, 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 hush. Something terrible happened here. So even in public gathering, when government officials stood up to talk, this is something terrible, Dr. Abu Lash, who is a Palestinian doctor, and I were on that trip. So I was like, Doc, I'm, he, he said, I'm just angry. He was angry, I was angry, I was ready to go to jail. So there's one day I'm to deliver the keynote. I get on stage in front of the highest council of everything from president to prime minister to chief justice to justice minister. Very few women and international partners there. And I stood up when I said rape, you could hear the gaps in the room. And I ended my speech to say if nothing was done, then those in charge was no different from Gaddafi. And I walk off the stage. I was like, girl, you're going to jail. <laughs> Did you just compare these people to Gaddafi? You're going to jail. So anyway, we left. And then we were in Congo, in the middle of a press conference, when I get a call on my cell phone. It was the Justice Minister of Libya. And he said to me, I'm about to leave this job. But something you said in this place has haunted me. I've done a law for survivors of rape. And I need you to help me for this law to be passed. Everyone thought the Muslim council would have been the most difficult. They passed it at a heartbeat. Parliament was our problem. We took that law to the UN, to this place, to that place, to the other place. Eventually, it got passed. For me... One of the greatest joy of that law was that women who conceived as a result of sexual violence could go and apply for passport. Because in most African countries, if your father's name is not on your birth certificate, you can't get passports. But that law states that women who had children as a result of sexual violence could apply for passport and no one would stand in their way and they set up some fund to contribute to the, the well-being of people. So that, again, is just one fact. But the one thing that I want to say, and the reason why I'm giving all of these examples, is not top level that has made these, work to, these things to happen for people. 
and whether it's Congo, whether it's Rwanda, whether it's Burundi, wherever there has been crisis, Nigeria, where you see Boko Haram and all of these things, is at the community level. Women at the community level are determined to survive, to live. So with or without donors' money, with or without the UN's permission, with or without all of the things that we're doing here, these women are determined every morning that we get up, we work for peace because this is our insurance policy for our children. I want to give everyone in the audience a chance to ask questions of our amazing guest tonight. So please get ready. And, and while the microphone is getting passed around, I want to pick up on something in your last answer um, just briefly, because you, you mentioned Ponzi in, um, in Congo, which is Dennis McQuaig's uh, organization um, that has been really you know, working towards addressing sexual violence. Um, and you've also mentioned going to you know, Israel and Palestine for women wage peace. And I've seen pictures of you crossing the demilitarized zone in between the Koreas in 2015 with folks like Gloria Steinem, right, on these, on these really important examples of cross context solidarity and collaboration and I'm I'm wondering maybe just kind of while people are maybe getting a cue going um, what you can tell us about the importance of that of that kind of global approach about trying to build coalitions across boundaries of place and of nation I mean one of the things I've learned is that when people have lived in war contexts there are different myths and misconceptions that people have about the place, about the people, about different things. You know, when people say, oh, I'm from Liberia, prior to the Nobel, or even now, people ask me, where did you learn English? <laughs> Liberia. <laughs> you know, and, and, but different things. So people yeah. have formed different impressions about different places. I tell you, one of my proudest moments, coming back from North Korea, I was coming back into the US. And so I was so stressed that, okay, North Korea, US, I'll get to the immigrations. I don't have a green card. I still come into this country on visa because I, I, I love being Liberian regardless of. So I'm, I'm thinking maybe they will call me into that room and ask me questions. What did you go to do to North Korea? And then I get to the security point and the guy opened my passport and say, Oh, you just came from North Korea. I am so proud of you. Did you see scrawny, dead, horrible people? Did you see suffering people? Did you see? And I was just standing there like, gosh. And he just went on and oh, you are so brave to be. Congratulations, you are a strong. And I'm like, oh. But again, in as much as we have our own mindset about how people live in these different spaces, it's important for us to engage. Prior to going to Korea, the number of death threats I got, emails, people were so angry that we had been bought by the regime in North Korea. Like, I'm like, my, my visa is $10. These people, as a Liberian, I paid only $10 to go. I, I, they have no interest in me, and I have no interest in them. We were going on a citizen-to-citizen -citizen mission. To answer your question, it's very important for us, and if you go on the internet, I gave a speech at Dartmouth one year, and I call it the Open Mind Challenge. And I think this is what we need in the world today. Open mind to engage and embrace. Because it's only by crossing over to the other, me coming and asking, People living here in Denver, how do you do it? And you asking me that we can truly come to understand that we are more united than we imagine. We share one thing, and that's our collective humanity. And I think if each and every one of us was focused on the collective humanity, it would be so easy for us to engage and embrace. I'll give you a short story again, and I'll take questions. I went to India last year to Kalash Satyati, my Nobel brother, the favorite brother of the Nobels. Don't tell the others. Yeah. <laughs> and I was at the Balashram where he rescues children 
who had been taken into slavery. And this night, the children were playing. Every night at Balashram is a party. So I'm sitting there, and they were dancing, dancing, dancing. This child came and stood next to me. He's probably eight, nine. And he's just looking at me. Looking at me. I don't speak Hindi. I don't speak any of the languages. But I saw a longing for a mother's touch. So I, I shifted in my seat and said to him, come and sit next to me. And he came and sat. Next thing, he showed me a scar, like a low sole on his foot, and he motioned that he was playing football. He fell, and then I touched it and said sorry. And he's, he kept looking at me, and something within me said, just give him a hug. So then I told him to, so I, because I didn't know what was appropriate, because as an African, I would have put him in my lap, <laughs> giving him a hug, but I was scared before they say, you know, they, they cancel me because this is the cancel culture. <laughs> so I, I hugged him and we sat down in my native tongue. They say, they, they, when they say mothers, a desire for mother, they say Newali. So I named him Newali for the rest of the time that I was there, that he has a desire for mommy. And so, every, but that night after I gave him that hug, when he was going to bed, you could see he came back and I gave him that hug again. Every day while I was at Balashram, he would come for his hug. That is what the world needs. You don't need to speak the language. You don't need to look the same. An understanding of our collective humanity. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I'm delighted to go to our um, very extensive list of folks asking questions, but I also just want to make it accessible to everybody. So if anyone's feeling like they can't get up and stand, please just, I'll look around and please give me a, a little sign and I'll make sure to call on you as well and we'll bring you a microphone, okay? Um, let's, let's can we take two questions at a time? Sure. Yeah, let's do that just so more people have a chance to ask. So go ahead. Fantastic, and just a friendly reminder to our question askers to please keep the, your questions brief so we can make as much time as possible to get to everyone, so. Hi, I'm AJ. Um, these are my three. So the question I have is, uh, you're talking about the power of women in, in doing things to change the world. Uh, I am not one, and uh, I am uh, curious, how do I support that, or at least not get in the way of it, because it's so easy for men to step in and then become the people that get the microphone and everything else. Yeah. So how, what are things you've seen that as, as they face challenges or we see things we can do that empower that process without taking it over? Thank you. Thank you. Let's actually question. take Let's one more two, question. Yeah. yeah, go ahead, Mike. Yeah, the okay. Johnson Five. Yeah. Hi. Um, so I was, uh, we're talking, okay. Um, I'm Louisa, and um, we're talking about courage in school. So I was wondering when, because obviously standing up to important people is really scary, and um, uh, women especially are questioned a lot. Um, so what gave you the courage to stand up to people? Because... Um, Sometimes they're just making very questionable decisions. Thank you. Um, let me let me take her question. Yeah. yeah. You know, sometimes people ask, "Don't you get afraid?" Of course, but I never allow fear to stop me. That's the first thing. The second thing is find your voice as a young person. Don't be rude. Don't, there'll be moments that you will need to be rude, but when you're much older, I'm 51 now, I can be rude. <laughs> but find your voice. Speak your truth as you know it. Don't ever allow yourself. They say, if you stand and allow evil to persist without doing anything, you've become a part of the problem. So, Courage doesn't come overnight. 
as a young child, I question. My grandmother used to say, I'm tired. Stop asking me, Ma, why is that man always beating his wife? And then she would say, go and ask him. <laughs> and then I would go and ask, why do you beat your wife? It's wrong. One day, I'll pray your wife will beat you. It started from there, like gradually. So things you don't understand, don't keep it there. Speak up about it. But also as you, you challenge any system, you also have to be compassionate. You know, my daughter and I, I have a 14-year-old, and we go back and forth with this. I said to her, you don't have to be friends with everyone, but you must respect everyone. That's the first rule. The second rule is, don't ever allow people to walk all over you. So if you can't stand up for yourself, how do you stand up for others? So you got to start practicing. I'm sure you, you have a bit of that in you, right? <laughs> By virtue of the fact that you walk to that microphone in this room of adults, people who knew you when you were in diaper in this community, <laughs> you are already courageous. Let's give it up for her. <laughs> so daddy's question. You know, most times when people talk about empowerment, <laughs> you have to give up some of your power. That's what empowerment is. And one of the things that I've seen with men who have been allies, they don't hold the mic. You know, if someone offered them the mic, they say, pass it there. You know, and, but they stand firmly behind this group of people, women, to say, this is it. And your first, your first line of practice, fortunately for you, are those ladies that God has given to you. So it's basically engaging them. My mom used to say my dad was not the typical African father. Because the typical African father would say, don't talk back. You know, people, children fear their fathers. We, he would negotiate with us. My mom was the disciplinarian. She had the bell, she had the cane. And she would say, the only thing we remember her saying was, Joseph beat them. And my dad would be like, no, we need to talk this through. And she would be like, why are you talking this true? Beat them. And he would be like, no. I just need to understand their mindset. You do not need their mindset. You are the father. Beat them. He said, Rachel, how do they go out and express themselves if I, as the father, have not given them the chance to express themselves? There we gain the confidence. Second, when we started dating, he would always call the young man and say, look at her. Do you see any scar? No. You see anything wrong? No. If you don't like her, bring her back. You touch my child, I beat the hell out of you. <laughs> but all of those things give us the confidence. People never understand that the little things that fathers would do will embolden their daughters to live their best life. Daddy, give up some of your power. The power to beat or discipline, negotiate. Daddy, it's time. I know you don't beat. It's time to go to bed. Mom say, go to bed. You say, I want to stay up. Why do you want to stay up? And I show mommy will be like, don't ask. Just let them know. No, 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 no. Let's just have this conversation. Because you see, the world that we live in, and I want to take a little bit of time on this, especially with young children, people tend not to pay attention that all of these things that we do, you talk about mentorship, you talk about empowerment, you can give them all of the programs in the world. But that first line is in that home. My kids are aware because I realized that I was doing everything in the world, but it was disconnected from them. The one time I sat to talk to them about girls who were out of school, and when they said, wow, I was like, you're in trouble. So now we spend time talking about these things. I've given them the, the, the freedom. It's painful as an African mother to hear them tell me, your right now, mommy, you just need to listen to our opinion and be like, ah. <laughs> but that is giving up some of your power. Do you have a question? Yes. Yes, mama, go right ahead. 
Hello, um, my name is Cecily, and I was wondering um, what led you to choose to write books and also become an author. I had too many things in my brain. And if I didn't write, I was going to go crazy. So since COVID, I started doing, um, if you go on my Facebook page every Monday, I do something called Monday's Motivation. I just write whatever comes to mind. But I've done two children's books. One is called Ma's Bed, and it was celebrating my grandmother. And the other one is called What is Human Fraternity? There are many more in the works. I'm still waiting for my publishers to decide which ones they will put out. In the next few months, some will come out for those who have boys. It's called Sons of Peace. Yes, and, and then I have just did another one, When Lights Embrace, and it's about Kalash, his wife, myself. When I was in India, I wrote that. I just felt like the world needed to hear more. And then also my faith is important to me. I'm sure throughout this conversation, you've heard me say, God, God, God. So during the pandemic, when I started doing the Monday's motivation, first it was to motivate me, but then it was to motivate others. Sometimes I write about God. Other times I write about politics. But my darling, it's important to write. There's an African adage that says, until the deer learn to write, the story will always, the narrative will always favor the hunter. So write. Don't let, as a young woman, be the author of your own story. Whether it's written or it's spoken or it's in action, never allow anyone to tell your story for you. Okay? I'm hoping my kid was listening to that. So that's, I'm looking at her over there. Okay, thank you. Clarissa. Hi, Hi I'm Clarissa. I'm one of Marie's students. Um, I kind of have a really broad question, so I understand if it's too broad for this time frame. But I was kind of curious about your thoughts about what's going on in Iran and Afghanistan with women's rights there and what might be steps that could possibly be taken against the violence. Should I just go ahead? Yeah. Go ahead, Arsalan. Yeah. Uh, Arsalan, um, I'm a visiting scholar here at the C Center. Uh, Lema, it's a, while it's a pleasure to have you here, I think uh, it's also very jolting to hear uh, what you've told us. And I say this because it's, again, very easy to celebrate what you've done and celebrate you as a person. But it's, again, very difficult to understand the conflicting roles that you have been in. First, as a victim, you've experienced a lot of you know, suffering around you, a lot, a lot of misery. And that sort of, you know, shatters you. Uh, that sort of annihilates you psychologically and emotionally and, you know, spiritually uh, and shatters you into pieces. But then you don't end there. You sort of, you know, assume the role of changing the situation that terrifies you. You put, off, put all those pieces together and get in the act of changing the reality. And you succeed. And you change that. And you don't end the misery, but you significantly mitigate it. And that's a big achievement. But it doesn't end there either, because, because then you get the Nobel Prize. Uh, and you assume the responsibility of bringing about that change that you brought about in a relatively smaller setting on a bigger level. So it's a big challenge. And you and I and all of us fail every day uh, in so many ways in bringing about that change with so many conflicts uh, being around us, so many misery uh, surrounding us, uh, uh, so much plight, so much suffering that we have to see everywhere, uh, regardless of the distance that we are, you know, uh, at from that suffering. So question one very precisely, and then a very short question after that. How do you reconcile these very difficult roles that you assume in different points in time in terms of your very non-linear evolution as a person and also as an icon. Uh, two, <coughs> uh, I hope I'm not forgetting the question. Uh, yeah, uh, so, so, very, very, very briefly, uh, you've experienced, uh, again, a lot of suffering, suffering that you've seen ar around you. Uh, you've seen a lot of people suffer around you. So again, a lot of plight, a lot of, a lot of things that sort of, you know, break you. Uh, and then while you experience all of that, and you, while you're, you're in that kind of a situation, you also see a lot of bad people around you, people who do terrible things. 
people who don't change, uh, people who aid and abet such people, they don't change in terms of their worldviews, in terms of their way of thinking. Even if you are able to change the situation that they are in and because of which you know uh, there is suffering, how do you reconcile with such people? Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, let me come back to the Iran Afghanistan question. One of the things again is the myth that when when we sit from outside and listen to the news and see the report, it shows hopelessness. All of our mainland media love to preach hopelessness. A lot of, there are positive things still happening in these places. They would never pick them out to show. There are women in Iran who are still resisting the regime. Afghanistan, there are women who are still pushing for different things. But also, if you look outside, oh my God, I've forgotten the name of the school, but she moved her students to Rwanda. So there's a school in Rwanda of Afghan girls. I was there, visited them this past July. I was in Rwanda. And so there, there are different things happening. And I think one of the ways we can support all of these women first is to ensure that their issues continue to be on the agenda. Because right now, the way the world operates is that the whole idea of peace and justice has become a trending issue. Today, if the last month, or six months ago, it was Ukraine. Barely anyone is talking about Ukraine anymore. Something else has taken over trending. A few months before Ukraine, it was Afghanistan. A few months after Ukraine, it was the Iranian women pro protest. Today is US-China relation. Every, everyone has forgotten all of the things that are happening. So let's all remember that this, as a matter of fact, there's nothing about Africa that is in anyone's face. Yemen babies are dying every day. No one is talking about it. So our role in these areas is not to prioritize conflict because suffering anywhere is if suffering in one place is suffering everywhere. We should focus on those issues that are happening. The question you asked about um, the roles being an activist and now a Nobel laureate, that was the first thing I promised myself. I am not going into any celebrity mode because I, this price is not, did you see me with bodyguards? I'm not one of those people. I keep it simple. Because what our world needs is still humanity. What our world needs is still an understanding whether I'm sitting with Antonio Guterres or I'm sitting with the youngest person in the community, I must be able to transfer the humanity from there to here. And I tell people that I am one of those individuals amongst my fellow laureates who's really blessed. Why? because I can go back to my village and work with the women, come to the national level and work with them, then go to the regional level, work, and then come at the international level. So the issues that I discuss is not issues from some theory paper. It's what I just experienced in Liberia two days ago, and I'm here today. I refuse to not be there. I refuse to allow this title to inhibit or prohibit me from being or helping the communities that I'm used to helping. So in, in, you would see me do UN work today, and tomorrow you will see me in my community distributing diapers to mothers who have babies. So those are the kinds of things. No, please allow them to ask their questions, the remaining people. I, I, I've been told that I've already let us go on too long. Oh, so I. Who, who said that? Was it a team? <laughs> team, is that you? I'm sorry. Okay, no, let, me no. take, let me take I those think we'd three. all stay all night, but let's, let's let do this. Let me take that three let's, questions perfect. quickly and then I'll end. Wonderful. I love that. Dean, did do you? Where's the Dean? Real fire. fast, though. You know, 15 seconds or I'm Ms. cutting you off. Miss Bowie, you are a beast. You are the definition of a beast. Thank you, are, you. You are incredible. Uh, my name is Liam. I'm with the World Denver Young Professionals. I'm very curious what the youth of Liberia 
uh, are up to these days, if you could speak on any organizations, uh, any movements right now that are pushing for change as you did in your youth. Thank, Thank you. you, Liam. Real Real quick. Other two. Thank you. Suzanne Gase, independent conflict resolution practitioner and scholar. Um, what do you see as the impact of social media on, P on mass movements? Perfect, Suzanne, thank you. Kim. Last but not least. Is it age before beauty, girl? <laughs> Hi, I just have a historical question. Charles Taylor, what was his motivation? What was his agenda? Why did he do what he did? Kindly ask the US government. Yeah. Taylor was supposedly, <laughs> it's true. Taylor was supposedly incarcerated in Massachusetts. They say he broke jail. How did he break jail to start a war in Liberia? No one has answered that question. Imagine maximum security prison in, Max, in Massachusetts. Someone breaking that and going. Don't you think a helicopter transported him from wherever to wherever to wherever and got him to wherever? <laughs> the US has a policy of your enemy is my enemy and I will find an enemy to fight that enemy. And so at that time, Doe was losing popularity so that he was getting too close to Russia. They needed to get him out. Taylor was the, the, the right person. There are many young people organization, young people's organization in Liberia really doing great work, especially now towards elections. We all know that we will have some semblance of violence. So a lot of these young people are out in their different communities every day fighting to ensure that other young people are not recruited to cause harm. So your question on social media is a huge question. We can have a whole day. But I think it's very important for us to begin to think about the sensible use of social media and how important it is to the discourse around peace. I, I, we can go on and on. But I will end with uh, um, one thing. I know this is the end. I, over the last few months, with everywhere you turn, people have been talking about the division in our world. Um, the US is going to elections next year. The politics is horrible. Everyone has a side, which is important. But in, in the divisions are leading to serious anger and bitterness that people do not see each other's humanity anymore. I was telling my daughter the other day that this is what I have come to recognize bitterness and anger to be. You have a loaded gun, but you don't know whether it has five bullets or one bullet. And you decide, I'm so angry with my opponent that I want to shoot myself. Let me just try one bullet on myself so I know how it feels when I shoot them. And then you shoot yourself with that one bullet, and then you realize that you have no more. You've killed yourself. That's what the anger and the division is doing to our communities. We are harming ourselves, the young girls that we have in this room, the young children that we have in our community. The question that I want to leave with each and every one in this room, what will it take to consider our collective humanity? Because I see you regardless of your color. The question is, do you see me? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. That's uh, one act I do not want to follow. I want to <laughs> say thank you so much, these incredible world-changing women. Let's, one more time. Uh, my name is John Krieger. I'm the executive director of World Denver, and I'm going to take less than 90 seconds to give you all a couple of ways that you can plug in, that you can uh, that you can become a part of World Denver's community and get engaged with global connection here in Denver. Uh, the first thing I want to do before I do that is just to thank Corbell. Uh, 
we are so fortunate as a city and as a community to have one of the best international schools in the entire country and in the world here in Denver with, the, with Corbell and with the C Center. So, uh, and, and it's one of the ways that World Denver has become one of the largest and most effective international exchange and global affairs organizations in the entire country. Our secret weapon is that we often recruit our staff, our interns, and our volunteers straight from Corbell. So uh, it's an important relationship to our, us, and we're so happy to be here tonight. We want to thank Corbell one more time. Um, then, like I said, in just a few seconds or less, I just want to uh, let you all know World Denver is a nonprofit membership organization that connects Denver to the world. We do it through international exchange. We do it through global engagement events, and we do it through uh, K through 12 education initiatives. You can learn more about all of what we do at worlddenver.org. You can hear about the events that we have coming up. And I'm just going to plug one, which is the Global Cup Challenge. That is our young professionals largest event of the year. Uh, for those of you who are interested in getting plugged in with the World Denver Young Professionals, it's the largest portion of our growing portion of our membership. The Global Cup Challenge is a trivia event that we'll host in a couple of weeks. It's a night where we raise funds for the young professionals, but most importantly, we just have a lot of fun. Good trivia, good food, good drinks. It's a great time to come out and meet the World Denver community. And for all of you being here tonight, you'll get an email uh, later this week that will include a promo code that will give you a little break on the registration for the Global Cup Challenge. So please join us for that. And then the last thing I'm going to say tonight, and this is really important, so I hope you all will listen. Uh, uh, Madam Bowie was here. She was brought here to Denver through an organization called A New Dimension of Hope. A New Dimension of Hope is hosting their gala event tomorrow night, No Time to Rest, where uh, Madam Bowie will be the keynote speaker. And she was gracious enough, and A New Dimension of Hope was gracious enough to share her with us this evening. And I encourage every single one of you to learn about A New Dimension of Hope, to support that organization if you can. Um, there are actually QR codes right here, up here on the podium, for both World Denver and A New Dimension of Hope. Uh, Ebenezer Norman, who I think is, is here, right over here, this gentleman over here in the t-shirt will tell you more about the work that they do to advance development and education on the continent of Africa. We hope that you will support them uh, uh, by either, if you, I think you can still attend the event tomorrow night, but you can certainly give, and I hope that you will. Thank you all so much. Have a great evening. We hope to see you again.